Hey, Kevin, as you a beautiful BC and somewhere down the States, this is Left of the Valley 2.0. My name is Kevin, and you know, if you think about the vastness, vastness of space and how enormous our galaxy is, how big our planet is, how tiny we are, I'm really not eating a whole bunch of cheese. <laughs> uh, joining me is friend of the show, Carl, that ain't Carl, Cosmic Carl. Carl, how you doing, my friend? Uh-oh, you muted yourself, buddy. You gotta unmute yourself. Rookie <laughs> mistake. <laughs> oh no. Oh, I'm man. doing very good tonight, Kevin. We're starting the show over. Start again. Say again. Wrap <laughs> <Just laughs> it. Carl, well, I'm glad you post. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Carl, I'm here. I'm glad you're here with me tonight because with us we have nobody else but our favorite guy, David Fitzgerald. David, how are you doing, my friend? It's always a pleasure. Uh, it's I'm always a pleasure. Uh, <laughs> I'm I'm home again on the internet. Yay! Oh my sweet Canadian home. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Oh man. So today we, we I want to talk about something very different and very interesting. Um, David, I want to talk about. Uh, we'll talk a bit about. Oh, that's not the one we want. Sorry, Kyle. We're replacing you here with David. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I want to talk about your upcoming book. We'll talk briefly about that. But I also want to take a look at you because you, you, you've you built a reputation as a mythicist. And, you know, we've talked a lot about Jesus and how we don't think, and I, I have a tendency to agree with you, I don't think he existed either. But what about all the other characters in mythology that we can, you know, Mohammed and Buddha and all that stuff. So anyway, yeah, first of all, yeah. let's quickly briefly talk about your book. How is that coming up? Sure. Sure, sure, sure. So it's it's coming out great. I'm about uh, two thirds of the way through it. Um, the middle is is it's it's packed so full of info that it's just a slog to really get through it all. But when I go back and read the chapters beforehand, it's like holy crap! There's so much information in this book. So I'm really <laughs> excited about that. <laughs> um, so just to catch you up for a little bit. I had been working on my sex and violence in the Bible. If you've ever seen my, my talk, sexy violence, violent sex, the weird ass morality of the Bible. I was turning that into a book mm -hmm. and uh, long story short, I came across some really, really interesting new information that was, had kind of blown my mind about the old Testament. Cause I've always been kind of a new Testament guy because I've been very Jesus heavy. Uh, mm -hmm. But then I started uh, hearing about a guy named Russell Gamerkin, who has really, his work has just overturned everything we think we know about the dating of the Old Testament. Ooh. And he makes a really compelling argument that our oldest books of the Bible, the, the, actually the first five books of the Bible, the, the Pentateuch, the books of mm -hmm. Moses, uh, yep. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, that all of those are based of two different books that were written in about the year 276 BC. So oh. hundreds of years, at least a hundred years before uh, even most secular historians think that these books are written and like a thousand years after what most religious biblical historians think um, that these stories about Moses and Adam and Abraham, the patriarchs, these were some of the last books to be written in the Bible, which blew my mind, just blew my mind. No, and, it's very uh, interesting because if all of a sudden, yeah. if all the, if this guy is correct and the books are written in yeah. two, three hundred years BC, and you're writing yeah. about a guy a thousand years before, how accurate can the story right. possibly be? It's and like a giant that, game but, of telephone. Well, yeah. yeah, exactly. And he's saying that he's pointing out places where they are clearly copying from these books that were written. Around the year 276. I mean, he's like he's pinned it down to the year that these things were written, yeah. and makes he makes the argument that the the Greek translation of the Jewish Bible, the Septuagint, that was written at the same time that the Hebrew version of the Bible. That those yeah. are coming from the same time in Alexandria, um, which which blows my mind because in my time shard books, a lot of the action takes place in Alexandria. So yes. kind of. I've been really on an Alexandria kick the last few years with the science fiction trilogy. And now it comes full circle because it turns out our old Testament 
a big, big chunk of it comes from Alexandria as well. Oh, uh, wow. It's kind of mind blowing. Kind of mind blowing. So yeah. uh, let me jump a little bit ahead. So last year, I think it was last year, I got asked to do um, uh, join in a e conference for the Global Center for Religious Research. And they was their international e conference on, on atheism, or historical Jesus, rather. Um, and I wanted to do a talk uh, that I've had in my mind for a long time because one of the side effects of being in the Jesus historicity game, if you will, um, looking at that was the most surprising thing for me was how many Buddhists would come up to me and say, yeah, we're having the same debates in our circles about whether Buddha really existed or not. And really? ex-Muslims ex -Muslims would come up to me and say, yeah, we're having the same debates on whether Muhammad exists or not. And, you know, yeah, Buddha not existing, that's not a hard sell. But Muhammad, that blew my mind. Mm. And when I was asking him, well, why are you saying that? Because we've got genealogies for him. We've got his friends and family wrote this stuff. He says, yeah, it doesn't turn out that that's the case. This is all stuff that's happening like 100 years after the fact and being retrofitted to be as if it came from the very first time. And when you start saying all the reasons that they're having their doubts, it's like, oh, okay, now this is starting to sound a lot like Jesus. And so to give this talk at the conference, uh, it occurred to me, you know what? I should just check and see if any of the other top 10 world religions, if there's the same pattern happening. And guess what? Every single one of them has a dodgy, dodgy backstory. Damn. To the point where it's like, it's not just Jesus. It's not just Muhammad. It's, it's like all of them down the line, even the ones I really didn't expect to see that coming from, like Sikhism, the, the religion of Sikhism, it's not even 500 years old or barely 500 years old. And right. so I was thinking, well, at least those guys probably started. It. Nope. Like the, of the 10 founding fathers of their religion, the religion seems to start with founder number five. It's just, it's wild to me how consistent this pattern is. David, are you saying here, live right now, that the only prophet we know for sure existed was Joseph Smith? <laughs> well, hey, oh, second. no. Joseph Smith? Wait a second, pal, because Joseph Smith didn't write the Book of Mormon. The prophet Moroni wrote it. And the angel Moroni yeah. and the prophet Mormon wrote it. Those That's guys are right. mythical AF. And yeah, so we're right back to square one with that. <laughs> uh, Wonderful. Yeah. yeah, people like L. Ron Hubbard and, and Joseph Smith, they're the outliers because we know who they were. All the other religions were just like that, only we don't know who the L. Ron Hubbards and the Joseph Smiths wow. were for the most part. You know, We've got some guesses for some in the Bible, um, but we really don't know for sure a lot of them. And I think there's more people made up in the Bible than we expect, than, we, oh. than most people suspect. Uh, uh, for myself, it doesn't surprise me, but I think for the vast majority of people, uh, it will. And uh, yeah. in light of what just happened to uh, author uh, Salman Rushdie, uh, if anybody oh, yeah. disagrees cool. with David Fitzgerald, he lives in Antarctica. Hey, that's, where you <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. In the my <laughs> fortress He's of solitude. In, yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, we laugh, but it is kind of scary. It is kind of scary. scary. Yeah. It's very scary. It's even scary to think that. Should you be correct, and should this fe this fellow be correct, that Salman Rushdie is being, you know, he, apparently he's probably going to lose an eye, and he's, yeah, he's going to yeah. recuperate still uh, over a fictional character. Ima yeah. Imagine being imagine being stabbed for Batman or something like that. It's right, so ridiculous right, this. yeah. It what should you say That's about Batman? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, no, sorry. I'm kidding. I'm so kidding. <laughs> Have you guys seen the movie Batman and Jesus? Speaking of which, I have not. I want to see it. I'm it's, sorry. It's I must be in the dark here. What is that? It's a indie film that talks about how um, what well, talks about Batman, and it also talks about the way that religions form their canonical gospels, and the way and it uses Batman as an example of okay. how the Council of Nicaea and groups like that formed what was going to be the official orthodox christianity and what wasn't it's fascinating because the analogy is spot on um oh, i'm gonna have to it, check it, that it really, out yeah it's it's worth seeing 
And uh, it's, I it's, happen to be in the movie, so yeah, it's oh, there we go. too. <laughs> it's yeah. so fascinating to see how yeah. easily people are fooled by these stories. I mean, uh, I'll, I'll tell Kyle a story. I'm David. I'm pretty sure I've told you this story before. But in 2016, there was an article that came out out of uh, Asia about uh, some village, some lost village in Indonesia, right? Um, where you know we're not, we're talking about you know not like a, a primitive primitive village, but pr- very isolated. Right. And authorities in the region started hearing the stories about this angel, right? That the villagers had found an angel. So by the time the authorities took time to go investigate, because the story is getting more and more prominent, the angel was crying, was uh, feeding the villagers. The, the villagers were feeding the angel, blah, blah, blah and there was yeah. prophecies of doom and shit like that. By the time the authorities actually walked into that swampy area, into that village to find the angel, yeah. they discovered a sex doll. Ha! The oh, wow. villagers had found a sex doll in the swamp. Wow. Cleaned her up, dressed her up, were feeding her, and all of a sudden, this is 2016. Okay, wow. this is five years ago. And by the time to- in a couple of months, there was an entire mythology already building up in 2016 around a sex doll. Wow. So you can't help but think, give two thousand years to that same story, and where mm-hmm. are we? Yeah. I mean, look, Kevin, Why I that? still have people commenting on my TikTok about the firmament. Like, I, I can believe anything at this point. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the that's the wild thing, too, is like, on one hand, it feels like it feels dickish and churlish to say, oh, and none of these guys exist at all. And yet that seems like a really important thing to know that yeah. all these mm-hmm. religions are. I mean, we, we know they're not true because religions aren't true and we have reasons for that. But to know, to see how the depths of it, uh, it's like there wasn't even some deluded, super um, committed guy who really legitimately uh, thought that he was hearing the voice of God. It's like that's there are stories all the way down. That kind of blows my mind. I mean, I, I this, this is probably a question that's more uh, for a psychologist and a historian like yourself, David. But what, what do you think? pushes people to make up these characters as real well first of all let's not call me a historian i am a history writer but i i always get crap from critics when i when somebody calls me a historian um but i think well it's a very evolutionary process and i that's what i talk about in the book is i talk about all the major stages that all the religions go to go through um no matter which religion you're talking about or how old it is, we can trace out from earliest human history the stages that religions go through. And when you zoom in on the microscope, none of them are alike. They're all like snowflakes. They're all unique and individual. But when you do zoom out with a big picture, they're, the structures are almost identical all the way across the board. The way you know that the gods may change, the dogma change, the rules change, but the structures of how these religions develop and go from stage to stage to stage and progress amazingly consistent. And what, it, what, it just what, fascinates what me. What does that mean to you? I mean, uh, can could you, could, could you, could you give a layman explanation well, of the structure? Well, I mean, um, for instance, I talk about like what religion was like before we were human, what religion was like in the earliest stages of, you know, caveman uh, period. Um, and how they goes from tribal to chieftain to city state to you know and just and builds and builds builds and as civilization progresses through these stages religion changes and they change in these remarkably similar ways um and it's fascinating to see um the evolution of it the evolutionary process of it um i think that's one of the most exciting things about the book and there's so many different um authors and historians that i'm drawing upon mm. um and i feel like the, this has all been out there it's like none of this is new and none of this is like hard to find when you start digging it, it, and it, the connections um are all there it's it's really wild to me it we- reminds me of a quote actually i'm forgetting exactly who said this but humans are Timekeeping, pattern seeking, storytelling creatures who are really good at telling stories about patterns, whether yeah. they exist or not. 
Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I do talk about Daniel Dennett wrote a great book called Breaking the Spell about all these evolutionary survival mechanisms that religions have co-opted uh, mm. in various ways. Um, and it, it is fascinating to see where it comes from. Yeah. Um, I mean, you, you see the evolution of religion right now in real time. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's never stopped. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, um, uh, and, it, and the interesting thing is it's not just religions either. There are, there are perfectly secular historical figures who never existed, and yet we all think they did, and we quote them, uh, like Aesop, like uh, probably Pythagoras, um, even oh, later, like William William Tell of Switzerland and Ned Ludd, the guy who led the Luddite movement against the Industrial Revolution. These guys are all ha come with a biography, and and yet they were completely made up, completely made up. Yeah, yeah. Wow, this, wow. and such recent time too. <laughs> exactly. Well, and when you think about it, um, think look at QAnon. There are people out there who believe that there is a, you know, high upper muckety muck of the secret government who's who's got his pulse on the on the deep state and it's just right. two guys from reddit two dudes from reddit have started all that yeah yeah yeah, yeah it's wild. And now jfk is coming back apparently right <laughs> it's like there was nothing so cr nothing too crazy for these people it blows my mind blows my mind do you, uh, do you does your research seem to point out that these characters that become essentially legend on the road and become figures yeah. of major yeah. movements are they often started just as a from by a charlatan is it better to be like the right hand man or woman behind the myth that's an interesting question i don't think they start as charlatans in that sense i think people like joseph smith are the outliers but one thing that's really interesting is like every religion that really gets on the big picture that makes it to that next big stage it both has something to offer the common people and it also props up the power structure and there's a there's all this debate about oh but you know this this religion provides these benefits oh but this religion you know props up the man and the most successful religions in the world throughout history have to do both at the same time to survive mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, that that was one of the big surprises for me. So okay, so let's 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 start digging just a little deeper, just a just a, yeah. a, a taste. Of let's let's pick one at random here. Let's do, use the big wheel, <laughs> and uh, let's grab let's grab the Buddha for example. Okay. So, so Buddhism, one of the major religions of the world, yeah, has a reputation of being one of the cool religion of the world, oh, <laughs> right? There's right. a lot of misogyny and sexism in Buddhism that people don't realize. Also uh, true, yeah. But the character, for, for the longest time, I thought the character of Buddha was an actual prince that... Right, left. Prince Siddhartha, and then he's yeah. got a story, his backstory and all that. I mean, I, I, I never believed that the guy was like, I think a lot of the stories about the Buddha were exaggerated, but I actually thought there was an actual basis for the character. And yeah, and that's, you. I mean, just scratch off the words Buddha and put in Jesus, and that's exactly how I was in the year 2000. Um, before I ever just went into investigating Jesus' historicity. So, um, so no, the Buddha is you're telling me is based on nothing. They well, I don't I don't want to say it's based on nothing, but what I'm saying is is these founder figures are not really the people who found the religion. They are the figurehead. They're the corporate mascot of these religions. Oh. Um, all these other people. Uh, and, and that's one of the reasons that the further you go back looking into any religion, you see it, you see different forms of it um, that go back all the way to the beginning um, to where you've got all these rival traditions and they usually come from older religions uh, that came before them. Um, but it, it's, it's, um, what am I trying to say? It's the social situation that gives rise to these religions. It's not that, oh, one day this guy appeared and said these new amazing radical things. That doesn't happen. Religions are, are being created all the time, but the ones that succeed are the ones that catch on with common people and are used by the whoever's in charge, in, in power. Right, um, of course, that would and, be the and, one that becomes the most popular. I mean, there right. has to be one. 
and and it's different that looks differently depending on what stage of religion you're in like the earliest stage of religion we you know when when we pre not not pre-human though i do talk about that um but early human uh the most um hunter gatherer societies the most primitive quote unquote type of religion there is no religion they don't have priests they don't have they have gods but they don't have worship they're their idea of of gods is all these animistic forces that are in plants and animals and weather and sky and sun and moon those are all gods for them everything has an animated spirit um but there's no priest class there's no dealing with these people um Mm -hmm. when shamanism comes around that's a whole this, this whole leap of complexity um for earliest religion um so yeah it's it's fascinating to see and the other thing is, um, like shamans were the first religious specialists to appear. And some of them seem to be um, as devout and as as um, earnest as anybody else. And some of them seem to be complete charlatans right out of the gate and wow. trying to tell who's insane, who's legit, and who's a, a scam artist. Those lines get blurred really fast when you, you were talking about early religious figures. So it's a bit, it's a bit like you know, you you have your your primitive person in ancient times, and you're thinking of the spirit of the rabbit, and then at some point you're thinking, you know, some of us got to be able to talk to those rabbits, right? And we have, right. we got to get organized. Right. We have to have a, well, a representative to talk to the rabbits, yeah. and then it, boom, and it, they're, they're it, all it, exactly. And there's all kinds of examples of the different ways that kind of thing plays out, like uh, all around the world. It's 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 really fascinating. Wow, that is yeah. fascinating. Yeah. So, so yeah. essentially, you're saying that the vast majority of all these religions are essentially almost like Christianity. I think Christianity is a perfect example. Uh, we yeah. think of Jesus as a central figure, but yeah. what we have exactly is a Pauline Christianity, right? Right. Because it's really right. Paul that kind and of there was, and, Paul and even Paul talked about how there's all these factions like, oh, I'm of Paul. Oh, I'm from Apollos of Alexandria. Oh, I'm of Christ. It's like and he says, has Christ been divided? Because even in his time, right from the very beginning of Christianity, you've got all these different factions that can't agree about the first thing about Jesus. And for instance, um, the third century, the Nag Hammadi uh, library is all these religious writings that got buried um, in the third century or fourth century, I forget which. Um, but nothing in those books looks like anything we think of as Christianity. And if those books had not been buried and discovered, we would have no idea that 200, 300 years into Christianity, there were Christians who believed the most bizarre things that we, honestly, we wouldn't even recognize it as Christianity. We have an you, know, I... you have an example, David, about the crazy, the crazy things they used to believe? Uh, well, like they were saying, there are 365 gods, not one god. Or that the God of the, the Old Testament is an evil God and not the real God, you know. <laughs> uh, I mean, it, it, the, the, it just keeps coming and going. Uh, it, it, there's so many different types of uh, early Christian belief that we had, not just Gnostic groups, but, but uh, you know. You know, I, it always struck me weird that – oh, I'm sorry. Oh, no, go ahead. Go ahead, Kyle. It, it always struck me that people would even think that a God – would use written word to convey a message when written word language is one of the most fluid things that we've created. You know, if you want to convey a solid message, you'd think you would write it in the stars in some language that we all inherently know. Yeah. That would be convincing. Richard Carey has made that argument for sure. Well, Bart Aaron points out, Bart Aaron points out, we don't have a single early Christian manuscript that matches any other Christian manuscript. Most of the time, that's from just grammatical spelling errors, something like that, but that's not special. It's the ones where there are deliberate changes. That's Mm. what blows my mind, is how much there is of that. Um, Wow. And by that standard, the, the New Testament doesn't do very well. Oh, and one thing I wanted to say a little earlier is the flip side of that is for the first 150 to 200 years of Christianity, we have no existing early Christian manuscripts that exist at all. 
Our oldest Christian manuscripts aren't even complete manuscripts. They're fragments about the size of a credit card. And mm. even those we're talking about late second century, early third century or later. Um, and, Astonishing. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so we don't know how much what we know as Christianity matches what these things were originally written as. Um, and we would have no way of knowing, even if somehow they were magically preserved and we just discovered them. And it's like, oh, here's an interesting variant manuscript of Paul. We'd have no way of knowing that's the authentic original Paul. Mm. And and uh, maybe maybe I'm going to play devil's advocate here for half a second for Kyle's question about, you know, why would they think writing was a, an appropriate method of uh, of uh, communicating the message from a, from a God, remembering that back then, the vast, vast majority of people were illiterate as well. So I think maybe in, in that situation, you know, the idea that a special class was there that was able to read uh, what was going on, uh, while the vast majority of people just had to take it on faith, right? So it was, it was almost like uh, uh, gatekeeping. Right. You know? Oh, we lost David there for a sec. <laughs> uh oh. Oh man, the joys of podcasting. <laughs> it's like it's trying to reconnect. Yeah, it's trying to reconnect. Oh man, David, if you can hear us, maybe drop out and rejoin. Oh, he's, that's what he's doing. <laughs> Perfect. Oh, oh, you see my huge face there. Oh, that's uh, that's horrible. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so this I, I I'm curious to see where where else he's gonna go at the with the this kind of information. Um there's so many things I find uh, fascinating about the historicity of Jesus. And you know, a, a lot of people are of, of the uh the point of it doesn't really matter. I, I think it does. I, I really think it does. Because you know, although although I'm pretty sure if Christians were to find out tomorrow that yeah, there was no actual Jesus or Jesus was just a man, yeah, they would still just, take it on faith. Yeah, exactly. They would still do something like that. But every every battle like that discredits their crappy religion. It really does. It's kind of it's kind of really hard to think about. Oh, Jesus said this, and Jesus said that when Jesus didn't exist, right? But you know, right. when when you, when you look at the, the the fight that they put on just to fight something like evolution, I, although the the fight for evolution is really something different because it's the one scientific theory that really, I mean, you could you could put God in just about any scientific theory you want, but when it comes to uh, when it comes to Jesus and and and, and evolution, you really have to uh, leave God out of it altogether, and I think that's why they fight for it so hard. I mean, if you're taking a literalist interpretation of the bible then you <clears throat> you kick the legs out from under the story with evolution because oh, right. there wouldn't have been an adam and eve yeah there were there wouldn't have just been two humans that's not how that works and if there was no uh, adam and eve there was no original sin then what there was no original sin then yeah. there was no reason for jesus to come in the first place exactly and this is the whole reason why they fight for this there we go there's back Woo! here we go back. all right so <laughs> all right sorry about that yeah so we were saying uh, for the first 200 years of christianity we don't even know what uh the original text uh said and we have no way of knowing ever what they said and even if we found paul's original handwriting written draft we wouldn't know it was that we would just know it was some weird variant of uh, paul's letter that we'd never seen before yeah and of course there's, there's also the idea that uh Paul, although he was not far from Jesus, was not there. He was yeah. not necessarily a contemporary of Jesus. Yeah, either. and and I'm having a lot more sympathy for people who say that Paul's letters uh, may have been written in the second century by Marcion, or may have been put together uh, in the second century. Because what one thing we do know is that all the legitimate letters of Paul, and that's only half the letters attributed to him, but even the genuine letters of Paul. Um, are mashups of more than one letter, and they've been edited and redacted. Um, so it's it's very it's an open question to know how much of what we're reading in these letters is the real Paul. Now, personally, if you ask me, if I was putting money on it, I would bet there probably was a Paul, um, and that 
because um, that seems the most parsimonious way to to explain why these these chunks of letters arrived. But no matter how you slice it, it's very weird that of everybody in Christianity for the first hundred years or so, we've got like the author of the book of Hebrews, who we don't really know who that is. And we've got all these letters by Paul and attributed to Paul. One dude from yeah. all these guys, and, and the rest are just forgeries in the name of the, of the apostles. But it's that's a weird situation that that they would all be on his shoulders. There's so much weirdness in the, the whole account of Christianity. I mean, we might, we might as well go all into it. Um, the idea that the story of Paul, the, the conversion story of Paul, you know, the famous story of, you know, persecuting the Jews, right. and, the in, and then he sees a bright light, falls off his horse, and that yet somehow the most famous conversion story ever yeah. is never actually mentioned by the man who supposedly he never says anything remotely like that. And you know what Paul loves to talk about? He loves to talk about Paul. Yeah. So it's like if that story was real and not just made up by Luke in three slightly inconsistent versions, he would have told us that. Yeah. You think so? Sure. Yeah. You think so? For sure. Yeah. And there's, there's things that just boggle my mind. It's like uh, Mark, for example, the, the 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 Gospel of Mark. And for people that don't know, the, the Gospel of Mark, you'll you'll uh, you'll uh, correct me if I'm wrong. He's actually the oldest gospel we have, right? Yep. Yeah. Okay. We're lucky we still have it, honestly, because. Matthew and Luke and John, they didn't set out to write the gospel according to me, me, and this other guy. They, all of them, and the other people who didn't make it into the, the Bible, they were all setting out to write the gospel, yeah. the one true gospel. Um, Luke even says that. He's the only one that pretends to even be writing history. He says, he starts out his gospel by saying, there's so many people writing gospels now, it seems to be a good <laughs> idea to go back and check out the real story as it's handed down to our generation. And then yeah. what does he do? He steals Mark and Matthew's story and 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 puts his own spin on it. I yeah. guess he lost Kyle. Oh no! Uh, he, he'll, he'll come back. <laughs> he come Hopefully back. will. Yeah. Yeah. So 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 Mark is the oldest gospel. Um, yeah. yeah. And, and and it's not the same uh, because in the in the book the order is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So right. but Mark is the oldest gospel. And how do we know it's the oldest gospel? There's several reasons, this, but the biggest problem is a uh, business reason. One of the biggest reasons, the last, sorry, is a thing called the synoptic problem. And we call it the synoptic problem. Actually, Christians call it that. For us, it's just the synoptic interesting situation, isn't it? But it's not a problem. Um, <laughs> it's that if you take those three gospels, um, you can see where Matthew and Mark are taking it directly from Mark uh, and expanding on it. Um, in, in their own incompatible ways. Mm -hmm. uh, and John is later still because he uses the basic storyline, but he doesn't try to keep his story even consistent at all from a timeline standpoint. So he has Jesus doing things uh, for completely different reasons and doing the same kind of things that he does in the other gospels at completely different times. Yeah. Um, and the whole reason he gets executed is for something that doesn't even occur in the other three gospels. So it's pretty wild. Yeah, it's it's very wild because it's, especially if you you put the gospel side by side by side, you're the one who told me this, David. So you'll you you'll you'll concur what I'm saying here is, Mark starts starts out to be the most like humble, normal, yeah. no gospel. frills, low rent Messiah. Yeah, yeah, he's the dollar yeah. store Jesus, right? Yeah, and and then by the time you get Matthew, who's you know seems to be have written the gospels for outsiders trying to attract people into the faith. And then Luke seems to be based on, you know, a very following the law kind of Jesus, you know, very proper, well, very correct. Well, actually, I would I'd flip that around. I would say Matthew is the one that's actually trying to make it the most Jewish gospel because oh, really? he's constantly correcting Mark's mistakes about basic Judaism and oh, geography. Okay. So it's like whoever Mark was, he clearly didn't live in Palestine. He clearly wasn't a Jew. Um, he was familiar with Jewish writings, but as far as just the day-to-day -day basics of being a Jew, he had no idea. And Luke was aware of all of this, but he wasn't a Jew either because he tends to repeat uh, Mark's mistakes about Judaism. Oh. And he's real familiar with things in Rome, like the three taverns and this all these sites that somebody in Rome would know. But um, he doesn't seem to understand the basic geography layout of Palestine or basic Judaism 101. 
Interesting. Um, and oh. he's he's interesting because Luke, he's like this big ticket guy. He wants to get everybody in. So it's like he has all these celebrity appearances in his gospel. That's pretty hilarious. Uh, <laughs> and he he reaches out to women. He reaches out to slaves and to uh, to Jews and Pharisees. And uh, he wants everybody in on it. And uh, he kind of, and of course, by the time we reach to John, John is like Jesus is Superman and kicking ass. And yeah, it it's like, did they run out of rocks in Palestine? Because like, how was he not stoned for blasphemy within two minutes <laughs> opening his mouth? Because he doesn't even try to hide it. He doesn't even try to hide it. It's like, oh yeah, I'm God. You know, that's me. <laughs> and uh, yeah, even when he's on the cross, it's like he's not doing it to save from their sins he's doing it to show that he's the boss look what i can do i'm gonna go, i'll be back in three days you know um yeah yeah he's, yeah it's 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 astounding the difference between the the, the personality just the personality alone of the, the four jesuses in the gospels and again those are just our ones that made the cut there were more gospels written more gospels more acts more epistles yes um, absolutely you know i know the first time i noticed that because you know i was raised catholic and uh, and when you're a child and you're going to church and you're bored out of your mind, you're trying to do something to occupy your mind, right? And I was always wondering why, when they were reading a pa passage of the gospel, like eight times out of ten, it was a passage out of John. Yeah. And the uh, the other time it was usually at Matthew, and it was very very rare that you would read a passage from Luke or from Mark. Yeah. And I was hoping every time I went to church every Sunday, I was hoping to pass this from Mark because my middle name is Mark. Ah, as nice. a child, that was important to me, right? <laughs> <So that's, laughs> yeah. It was like, how oh, come I'm not reading from Mark? And then suddenly <laughs> I realized why, why and those Gospels are written that way. And like you said, Mark is just the little frill, basic Jesus. It yeah. makes all the sense in the world when you're selling a religion. Of course, you got to use yeah. John all the time because Jesus is yeah. that freaking good, right? Yeah. Now, well, wasn't, wasn't there a. Oh, oh. oh. <laughs> we no, did no, it again. Ahead, Sorry. <laughs> um, wasn't there a story in one of the books of the Bible that wasn't in the Bible of Jesus? like killing a kid for looking at him the wrong way or something like that. Yeah, that's the infancy gospels. Though I thought you were going to be talking about the woman caught in adultery because that's another story that obviously wasn't in our earliest gospels. It came mm -hmm. much later. Uh, but yeah, the infancy gospels were a whole genre of early Christian writings. They're like, well, Robert Price puts it as like, they're the Smallville stories of, of Christianity. It's like, <laughs> what was he like as a little kid? And he was like half Dennis the Menace, half... Uh, half Damien, he was, uh, did, you ever, did you ever see that old Twilight Zone episode about uh, Billy Mummy is the, the kid in the town and he's got these horrible godlike powers and he's wishing people into the yes. cornfield all the time? That's what baby Jesus is like in these stories. because he's. Like, oh my gosh. You know, he'll do a miracle here and then some kid will piss him off and he'll just strike the kid dead, you know? Children <laughs> from the uh, corn. It's not bad. Children from the corn, yeah. It's good that you did that, baby Jesus. It's real good. It's really, really good. <laughs> Please don't yeah. tell you they're wrong. <laughs> yeah. Wow, okay. Great. I'm glad and I it's asked. It's funny because those Christians in the second century – if they realized that we didn't have those stories, they'd think we were only like some kind of half Christian or something. It's like those were those are going on for a long time. When when it comes to mythicism, uh, it divides the atheist community. And, sure does. And it sure does. Yeah. Then uh, I, I I mean I I fall on the side of mythicists uh, like yourself there, David. But I don't understand the argument on the other side. What, what's I mean? They, they always start quoting Bart Ehrman at some point. Yeah, and I love Bart Ehrman. Yeah. Don't get me wrong, yeah. I mean, he's a fantastic guy. But what is it What is it that he's got that he, he brings that is so compelling for these people? Because I just don't find the, the argument. Well, yeah, and that's the thing. It's like he's written so many good books that I've been saying for years that for a, such a staunch historicist, he's one of the best mythicist writers out there. Because the stuff he's pulled the, the curtain on, on biblical studies and just what's in the Gospels, I mean – I feel like, and again, this is another quote from Price, he's sawed off the limb that he's sitting on right now, long time ago. Um, well, here's the thing, though, and this surprised me when I wrote Nailed back in, in uh, 2010. Um, it wasn't that Christians hated it, because, you know, of course Christians are going to hate it. Mm -hmm. But I was shocked how many atheists didn't just hate it, but they, I mean, they didn't just disagree with it, because that's fine. 
but they treat it like, oh no, this is a Holocaust denial. This is moon landing denial. This is flat earth level stuff. Yeah. And that is, that's really interesting to me. And I, it's, it's very frustrating to hear atheists aping the Christian biblical scholars on this because Christian biblical scholarship has a lot of problems. And Bart Ehrman knows that as much as anybody else. Uh, Hector Avalos knows that. You know, everybody who's studied what uh, even Christians have pointed out that there's some serious problems with Christian scholarship. Um, and yet, when it comes to this particular issue, uh, you know, they they always like punt to, well, what's the scholarship of the consensus of biblical scholars? Well, yeah, yeah. first thing, maybe we should look at who are the biblical scholars? Because exactly. as it turns out, 100 percent of biblical scholars or i should say 100 percent of all christian scholars are wrong about there being a god and they're wrong about jesus largely for the same reason and i, I talk about that in jesus mythic in action about how much christian biases and and uh presumptions pervade uh biblical scholarship and i'm far from the most qualified or the earliest first person to say that but, that but you're much more qualified than i david so so mm -hmm. what, if I was to ask you, what is the most compelling argument for the existence of Jesus, in your opinion? What is that? Well, let me start up by saying this. It's like, there's nothing implausible about Jesus being a guy, just yeah. a normal guy. Absolutely. That's not a problem. Um, the thing is, it doesn't seem like that's what happened. And again, there's uh, scholars out there, secular biblical scholars, who say everything we know about early Christianity we can account for that whether there was a guy named jesus or just people preaching about a guy named jesus either way we, christianity makes sense uh, according to what we know about its rise and its long rise until it got popular um so it's like i don't understand the hostility it's like it's one thing to say no i think there was probably a jesus and that's not a bad uh base position to take that's not a bad uh um assumption to make because mm -hmm. i certainly thought there was a jesus for forever yeah, when i was an atheist um for 16 years and it wasn't ironically until i started reading you know the, the gospels and seeing how you've got radically different jesuses in each one and wondering well which is the real jesus which one is giving us the actual story and which are just full of legendary bullshit that came later and the thing is once you try to parse that out you realize, oh, it looks like all of these guys are made up. Because our earliest gospel, Mark, the one that all the other gospels are built upon, looks like it's a 100% allegory. And we can go point after point after point of situations in the gospel that make no sense logically, historically, or even plot-wise. Like, for instance, his trial and his execution. None of that makes any sense mm. historically. Uh, according to Jewish law, uh, the Barabbas uh, incident, none of that at all makes sense. Um, but things like that and like the cursing of the fig tree, all these weird rando things like Jesus getting mad at a fig tree and cursing it because he didn't know figs weren't in season. It's like, none of that makes sense. None of that makes sense according to what our Jesus. And yet it makes all perfect sense when you see it's an allegory. Yeah. And you can repeat that ad nauseum and there's it's an interesting thing too is like when pastors today talk about jesus they punt to the gospel and say well jesus did this did this but before the gospels are written nobody talks like that paul yeah. never talks like that the author of hebrews doesn't talk like that their jesus is somebody celestial and who speaks to them through their bible study of the jewish scriptures and through, uh, you know, uh, visions, basically, and revelation. Mm. Um, and Paul acts like no one would know anything about Jesus if it weren't for pastors like him. And to Paul, an apostle is not a disciple of Jesus. He never uses the word disciple ever in any context for anybody, let alone says that Jesus had disciples. And the guys that we think of as Jesus' disciples, the the head of the jerusalem church like peter and paul those guys paul acts like they're not even real christians um he says you know this is like verse just a few verses after supposedly he talked to james the brother of the lord um 
He's saying, these guys, I don't know who they are. I think they're bringing in fake believers. And I didn't give in to them for a second. It's like, it's astounding to see how much he hates those guys and thinks yeah. they're, they're bullshit Christians. Yeah. It, it's, it's, it's not just, especially when you, especially going back there on the Gospel of Mark being not just allegory. It's allegory that's also written decades after the supposed events. Oh, that, and, yeah, that's true, too. Right. Yeah, good point. None of these are eyewitness accounts. None of them claim to be eyewitness accounts. And all of them are written way towards the end of the first century. Um, Luke, for example, he steals from Flavius Josephus, this Jewish historian, so much that we know he couldn't have written his book before the year 93 or 94 at the very earliest. If he like, oh, I love this and started breaking his own gospel right out of that. But he probably did it more in the second century, you know, and John later still. Um, yeah, there's just it's just physically not possible that anything any of this that was written before the war with Rome, in the case of Mark, um, at the earliest, at the yeah. very earliest. Yeah, there's, there's so much. I mean, there's so much wrong with the story of Jesus to begin with. But there's yeah, so yeah. much wrong with the story of after Jesus. This, this is what is mind blowing to me, and I, I keep I keep bumping into those people. So of course Jesus existed. All that. I say, but look, you can't even give me an accurate description of the most charismatic yeah. man that apparently existed. I mean, we yeah. know the shoe size of Hercules. <laughs> we agree that Hercules was a fictional <laughs> character. We know the yeah. shoe size of Hercules. But yet, well, you can't tell me how tall Jesus was. You can't tell me yeah. if he actually had a beard yeah. or not. There's some depiction of him completely shaved off. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We have different images of him throughout time. Sure. And, you know, I think for in Nailed, I make this point that we know what time Cleopatra put an asp to her breast. And yes. We know what day, you know, um, you know, get it, down yeah. the line of all these different ancient yeah. things. We don't have a single date of Jesus' life whatsoever whatsoever and the ones that we think we do they're guessworks and there's usually like you know some wiggle room on two or three um and when it does give us a a, a, a date it's in conflict with some other gospel so it's like matthew has him being born 10 years at least earlier than luke has him born um which you know, is really just, fun. they're completely incompatible yeah which is kind of funny to me like with I know several Christians who are infatuated with things like numerology. Oh mm -hmm. God! Yes, yeah. and angel numbers, and Ugh. you would think that they would have the specific time that Jesus was born, or right? they, they would keep track of something, like you were saying. Yeah. yeah. Well, they know he's a Capricorn, you know. But, <laughs> but, it, but you know what's funny is in the early Christian church, there were debates on when Jesus was born. December twenty-six. It took. Hundreds of years for that to get hammered out. At, or, um, there was like eight or seven different options that Christians were uh, presenting. Yeah, and yeah. there was even Christians who were arguing that, no, Jesus was born during the reign of Alexander Janias, 100 years before what we think of. Uh, and people saying, oh, no, no, he was born during, you know, the reign, you know, 60 years after the fact. Mm -hmm. um, it's the, the amount of things that Christians could not agree on the basics. It, it, it's, it's amazing. They've had so much time to shave off the serial numbers and get their stories straight. And yet we still see traces in the Bible of, uh, of the differences that never got hammered out. And if you look at early, when you're talking about early Christian writings, yeah, it's way off the table. Yeah. There's a few, there's a few things that I find completely mind blowing about this is one, uh, for example, first, for a person, let's say you're a you're devoted follower of Jesus, you're a disciple. You're yeah, a disciple. Yeah, okay? yeah, you believe yeah. this guy is the, the embodiment of your God or whatever. Yeah. You yeah. have absolutely no relics whatsoever. His carpentry tool, yeah. did he made it to make a table? His sandals, his yeah. robe, a lock of his hair, anything. Did he not write a, a goddamn word? It's like, yeah. 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 The yeah. Cup he from? Normally, I mean, they have like five or six of his foreskin for some reason which is yeah pretty, right oh there's a, i think they're closer 14 of them but yeah oh, yeah God, exactly. that's, that's <laughs> that wow yeah uh, um, but you, you think you think you think we have like a, a table or, or he was a carpenter you think you'd have somebody a chair that you <laughs> need at some point and uh, and during the middle ages stuff like this did start popping up but you know not for hundreds of years yeah um and even even pilgrimages to the empty tomb and stuff like that that didn't start until Constantine's mother 
the uh, emperor, you know, the uh, whatever her title was, but you know, the, the 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 emperor's mother went to the Holy Land, and that's when pilgrimages kicked off. Is because oh yes, your highness, and here's the spot where he was born. Oh, and yeah. here's this spot. And, that's you know, a big business. It's a big business, yeah. And, the, and you, you the quote, there's some medieval quote saying if they took all the pieces of the, the true cross, they could build a boat out of them or something like that. <laughs> it, would, it would fill a hole of a galleon, yeah. And what's even more mind blowing to me is you could still see remnants of this kind of mentality today, because the the, the fight that Christians have been having about Jesus are the same kind of fights today nerds have about Goku versus Superman or something like that. Do you not know, get me started on that. <laughs> one. You, know, you know what I mean? Yeah. You know what I mean? You you <laughs> yeah. fighting over the internet over two fictional characters yeah, about who's stronger than who absolutely. is the exact same echo. That we hear 2,000 yep. years ago about Jesus yep. doing this and Jesus doing that. So true. So exactly. true. And the same tropes show up in both genres. Yeah. Yeah. And you have the yep. same you have the same division. Oh, I can't believe you would think that Goku would beat Superman. I'm not talking. <laughs> yeah. We're not yeah. talking to enemies yeah. from that. You can't Superman, you can't Goku, whatever. It's like, it's it reminds weird. me of that, that scene in uh, Conan the Barbarian. When uh, he's having to debate, that, oh my God's a sky god. Oh my God's a hill god. Well, my you know, hill gods are not as tough as sky gods. You know? that, yeah, he, he yeah. lives under my god, right? He's a, he's yeah. under my god. <laughs> it's like, yeah. it's yeah. so yeah. ridiculous. Oh my God. Oh man. <laughs> it, it, it is. It's ridiculous after the fact. You know, in hindsight, it is. But when you're in it, you know, it's it's funny how much it shapes your your universe. Uh, to where you don't even think about is this fake? You know, is this? Um, that, that's why I love when Christians and atheists have discussions because it gets them out of that mindset long enough to to think, hmm, do I believe this? You know, because every Christian, if they have any kind of self awareness at all, they've got to have doubts about something, and it seems like it's different for everybody. They'll in some point in Sunday school, the teacher will say something and they go. That doesn't make sense, and then they compartmentalize it and they bury it really deep. Mm. Um, and then it comes out later when, with whatever triggers it finally. Um, and I'm always fascinated by what it, what the one piece for this person or that person was. It's a very scary thought to think that you know our entire society and wars and all the bloodshed has been built on a nerd debate from the Bronze Age. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And when you put it that way, and and again, these things are hand in hand with power politics as well. And, oh, yeah. and I don't want to, I don't want to, uh, you know, there, there's multiple things going on, but it, it really is fascinating to see throughout history how you see the same kind of uh, pro- uh, processes and dynamics at work, regardless of whether you're talking about Marduk, where you're talking about you know uh, Ahura Mazda of Zoroastrianism, where you're talking about Jesus, where you're talking about Moses. It's like these same patterns show up uh, for the gods, for the the speakers of the gods. You know, yeah. Um, it wow. just, it just we're, we are storytellers. We're, we're yep. apes that make tell stories, big time. And <laughs> that's that's really it is. I mean, and it's yeah. myth upon myths upon myths. That's the thing yeah. that kills me too. It's turtles and, all, and all the way all, down. It's turtles all the way down, and they cross pollinate each other. So it's like these gods in these religions appear. And then they go away. But the next religion has a lot in common with his old religion that used to be there. You know, <laughs> yeah. the, the like Christianity you did, and the paganism. More you find the roots. Yeah, absolutely. The more you find roots that are going oh, over here, not just to Judaism, but to, to, to Egypt, to Persia, to Rome, you know, uh, uh, oh. the, to Greece. It's so wild to me how interconnected they all are. And uh, David. Thank you so much for helping us on this today. I really appreciate it. If people want to find out more about your books and where you're going for it, what what's coming up for David Fitzgerald, where can they find you? Uh, well, I've got a website now, davidfitzgerald.org. Which I'm, and when I'm not working on the book, and I'm working ferociously on the book to get this done this year, um, <laughs> you can get updates there. Uh, Facebook is always a good place to find me because I'm usually, you know, easy to find there. You can always shoot me an email at everybodylovesdave at gmail.com. And, um, I'll confirm that. Everybody does love Dave. Oh, (laughs) don't. And uh, yeah, in the meantime, I'm really super excited about this book. Um, I think if you like Nailed or Jesus Mything in Action, this book will really blow you away as well. Because 
uh, I didn't think I had anything new to say about the myth of this argument. And this like blows everything wide open. And it's, <laughs> there's just so much going on. It, re- it blows my mind. I thought it was going to be like, I thought I was just going to bang out this little tract, you know, of, you know, 90 pages or something. It's like, no, there's some heavy duty stuff going on in here. And it's a fascinating read. You think you'll have a you say? I, I'm not sure. I, I, I feel like I'm just cresting the midway point. And I suspect last third of the book is going to go really fast, but who knows? I thought I was going to be done with this back in May. Yeah. So, so yeah, we'll see. Sure but soon. You. But it will <laughs> be soon. It will yeah, be soon. Percent, we'll have you back for sure because we'll discuss awesome. this. I'll be, I'll be front okay. and center in that book. Well, anyway. let me just say that I am. I was uh, delighted to be a part of this conversation tonight, David. Kyle, Actually. thanks for being here tonight. David, I got to have you say as usual. Hi, this is David Fitzgerald, and I took a left to the valley. Hi, this is Dave Fitzgerald, and I took a left at the valley.